Hello, everybody. Let's see. Hopefully, we have people here. Yes, we have a lot of people here. Excellent. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. I'm excited to talk about how to get team wide in, you know, buy in uh, from your repo and trying to get everybody on board with your plans and your vision of how you want to share insights and how you want to organize insights for the organization. So um, today we have a special guest. Uh, we have Ali Bloom. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about, uh, about Ali in a second. Um, I see that we have a lot of familiar names uh, in the audience. And so there's a lot of customers. So you will enjoy deeply this because you're probably still working on the process of getting people on board of the repository and evolving your uh, your implementation and so on. If you are brand new to Enjoy HQ, I'm the founder, Sophia, and we basically help product design and research teams to centralize customer feedback and user research data to build better research workflows and to share insights across the organization. And we can talk about it at another point and you can book a demo, but the important thing is that we have here Ali Bloom. Um, I met Ali a couple of years ago, and Ali has done an incredible job working with a ton of different companies, helping them structure better research processes, helping them implement research, specific research projects. She's also a copywriter and helps a ton of SaaS companies to improve, improve their onboarding, uh, hypothesis validation, a ton of different things. So she almost works as a, I will say, um, like an external UX research team that comes in and helps organizations to get to a certain stage and then move to the next project and so on. So it's a research partner. And um, she's been uh, working very closely with a couple of our customers, actually. You might have been working with her in the past. Um, and because she's seen so much around the struggles of building an effective research repository, the struggles of changing the culture around research and especially once you have a good system like how you scale that to more team members and how you really turn it into culture instead of just one project that happened you know a couple of months ago just really implement that at the core of the organization so she's going to share a lot of the things that she has learned uh across that journey and of course i would like to share a couple of things as well uh, but this is the plan for today we are going to talk about the five stages of implementation that most of you, if you are in the process of implementing a research repository, you will be going through these stages and you might be in all of them at once. Uh, then uh, Alice is going to take over and she's going to talk about you know, how you get people on board. And then we are going to have a Q&A session towards the end. So you can start adding your questions to the live chat. We have Lucas there, he's uh, part of Enjoy HQ. He will be making sure that your questions um, don't get lost, that uh, if you have additional questions that can be you know, answered right away, that we do it, if you need links and so on. Also, in the live chat um, section, you will see a little tab called handouts. Then the slides uh, will be there for both presentations, Alice and mine, so you can download them right away and just enjoy and focus on the presentation. Um, and Talking about that, let's actually get started. Um, hey, let me just go back here one second. Um, yeah, I said the recording is going to be back, right, Ali? Yes, I think I said the recording will be sent right after. Oh, I see. We have some mess. Excellent. Okay, that's it. Let's get started. <laughs> so this is a roadmap of what we have seen happens when organizations, especially research and design teams, um, do when they're trying to implement a successful research repository. And even though it's a lineal um, kind of illustration, it actually doesn't happen that way. Uh, a lot of these stages happen at the same time, and it's really, really dependent on the uh, UX maturity of the organization. It's really dependent on uh, the, the structure of the team, uh, where the data is stored, what are the key challenges around research inside, the culture, there's a bunch of stuff involved there. But one way or another, you start the journey by identifying that you have a pain point. Um, and that pain point sometimes is, uh, sounds like this. You know, it's taking us a lot of time to do our research and the product team is not taking advantage of our insights because apparently things are going to slow on our side. Or we have all these insights 
and you know the entire organization should know about them but only a very small group uh, knows about them and, and is making decisions on those insights and we would like everybody to have access sometimes is that the analysis of the data the actual research process is very tedious and difficult because you have data in different tools and you have different methods and every team member is doing research their own way and everybody's storing those insights in different places um, sometimes is is it's more a pain point on we are too constrained like we only have one researcher for five six different product teams and it is really hard for me to do all the research needed to to really support all the product teams so there are a lot of pain points that you might experience and might make you think oh we definitely need a better system to do uh this in the organization um sometimes the answer is a research repository sometimes it's not and what is very, very important at the very beginning is that you really identify what is the core problem. Some teams that have um, a very immature UX kind of organization or they have challenges in terms of culture, think that by enabling the business to have more access to data, that will solve the problems. And that not, is not always the case. Uh, sometimes it's not about accessing the data, it's about what people want to do with the data and whether or not they want to have access to that data. But if you have an organization, that is excited about UX research or is interested at least to develop and evolve UX as a function. That as an organization that is investing in that area, whether it is because they're hiring researchers or perhaps they are investing in tools, you might have a little bit more chances of success to actually implement a repository and enable everybody to increase uh, or the quality of their decision making based on customer insights. So we will have almost a webinar or, or a program for each of these um, sort of parts of the journey, but we're going to be diving into one specific one, uh, which is access and empowerment. But going back to the business question, once you decided, yes, we need a research repository, we're going to look at, for a tool, we're going to implement something together, the next step is normally, um, let's have a look at what we actually have, the audit and inventory kind of stage. Uh, you know, what is the data store? What kind of tools are we using? Where are the actual insights are um, stored and shared? Who actually uses those insights? Is anybody requesting research at all? So, you know, is what we have a store today, what we have available is still useful or is still uh, relevant to add into a new tool and, and, you know, kind of centralize that data there? There is a bunch of stuff that needs to happen in terms of a, a the data that you have, the research that you've done, the insights that you generated, and whether or not those are still relevant and need to be part of a repository. So that stage happens there. Then, kind of in parallel, the next thing that you start thinking about is, okay, how are we going to call and organize all these things? We have all this data coming from places, we have all those insights, do we have a common language? Can we essentially uh, share this data and everybody will uh, find it easily in an intuitive way? Do we have a way of aggregating that information so we can see trends uh, over time or we can connect the dots better between studies and so on? So we have a taxonomy kind of webinar uh, coming uh, mid-September that will be specifically designed to talk about uh, taxonomies for research repositories that uh, either researchers or designers are trying to build. So you will have the ability to uh, deep dive into everything related to taxonomies, but also some teams will be sharing their own taxonomies and how they evolve them, so it will be highly practical. Then after you have a taxonomy, you have the data that you want to organize and you know what you have, um, you go to this stage of trying to give access, let's say, to help other people to use that data, to empower themselves, to self-serve, Really make use of all that good research that you're doing. So in that stage, that's what we're going to focus today. But it's all about. It, it contains a lot of things actually. It contains anything from you know privacy and, and data from participants. Uh, who's going to actually have access to the raw data or just to the insights? Uh, how people are going to make decisions on this? Um, how often people need to query the data? Uh, there's a bunch of stuff there. Uh, but we're going to concentrate today uh, on more of the how you build momentum around those things. And then finally, optimization is just this stage where you already have at the foundation there and you're just trying to make sure that the repository is useful. 
still helping people to make decisions that the data it is easy to search and you keep optimizing the structure of the of the data and the people that are participating within the repository and that is an ongoing work this is a system and as a system it evolves so you will always have to you know look for ways of improvement and get feedback from other people in the organization so as i said before you go through all these stages sometimes at the same time it looks like a bunch of meetings and workshops and discussions and then you move forward as you go but um there's a lot of uh, people writing about this right now and what i've seen is that there is always this high level approach to it it's like and actually we wrote um and a blog post called why research repositories failed and you can search for that and in that repository i added this graph most people uh, go about it thinking, okay, let's start with the research team. Let's start with a very small group of people that will be implementing and using the repository first. Then let's expand it to people that do research, but not all the time, like maybe PMs, maybe marketeers, maybe other people that do ad hoc research and might benefit from whatever capabilities their repository has. And finally, fine, you know, let's open this to the entire organization to help people consume it and so on. Like this is, feels like a natural way of going about it. And it is indeed, but it's a lot more messy because your organization is not built in that kind of um, sort of a street way that you don't have teams that don't talk to each other at all. You always, you know, collaborating in professional ways. So you have to manage it slightly different. It's more fluid, it's a bit more chaotic, but this is normally the approach that people take. And um, I see it successfully happening, but there is a lot of things in between. So Ali is going to share with us all the different things that you need to consider to, to actually move through those phases in a successful way. Um, let me see. So final, final uh, sort of before I get into Ali, um, final uh, reminders. The slides are there for you to download, so don't worry about it. Just enjoy the session. Again, keep dropping your questions uh, in the live chat. We want to answer all of them at the end of the session. And with that, I'm going to introduce Ali. Come here, Ali, take over. You can now take over. Hello, the thank you. Excellent. And also, Sophia, I don't know if this was intentional, but we lost your video. Um, just gonna let you know. Okay, great. Let me pull up some slides. I'm assuming everyone can see the slides and you will notify me if you cannot. Thank you so much for introducing me, Sophia, for having me. Thank you everyone for joining. I'm so excited to talk about this phase. Like Sophia mentioned that that stage when you're really trying to get everyone who needs to use enjoy to use enjoy to use it the way that you want them to use it so that you can build that foundation of having a solid research repository as, that you can eventually grow across the organization. So we're going to uh, go over some things that are going to be really helpful for people who are in this in this phase, either recently or right now or approaching it. So you'll, you're already sold on setting up that repository that we're not going to talk too much about the benefits of having a repository for you, except in the sense of how we can frame the benefits for your colleagues. We're also going to be really uh, ge gearing this towards folks who are uh, are clear on how many other people are going to need it. Maybe not the exact number, but you know you're going to be working with other people. Your research in the repository, you can do some analysis. That's pretty cool. You can find it, but not everyone can find it, and you can't find other people's research unless it's all in the same place. And then finally, this is about this is for people who are working on that buy-in phase when you're talking with your boss or your team lead or your teammate, those people who are going to interact in some way with it, not compliance and procurement, it's a whole other process. So the big things that we're going to go over are first, how to identify your stakeholders. So when you're getting that foundation really built of who's going to use your repository and how they're going to use it, that those conversations happen one at a time, one person to one person or one person to a small group. So how can really we really understand and identify and build a case for each of the people that we'll speak with? One of the things that we're going to really, uh, one of the best strategies that I have found to be successful is going over and identifying the state of awareness for the person that you're meeting with. The exact pain that they feel may be different from the pain that you feel, and they may not be aware of it. They may have only just started to realize that things aren't working as well as they could be. And then finally, how to take all of that information and form it into the kind of presentation structure that you can plan, use, repeat, so that when you go into a conversation with someone, 
you're you're so prepared that you know that everyone's going to walk out really excited to use the repository the way that you know will make everyone successful. So, and an alternative title for this is Sales 101. So I know as researchers, I am a researcher, I know we don't like being sold to. No one likes being sold to. However, I came to research and UX, as Sophia mentioned, via conversion copywriting, which is a discipline that, much like UX, uses qualitative data as the foundation. Everything about the input is qualitative. A lot of what comes out is voice of customer and rearranged into sales messages. And one of the one of the principles of the discipline, which is I should, it's really cool and interesting if you if you want to learn more. It's over 100 years old, pulls from lots of direct response. Really about centering the person that you're speaking with and showing them how their life can be better. We're not here trying to sell somebody something they don't need. This isn't like a you know used car salesman selling you a car without an axle on the side of the road or the highway. This is something that you know is helpful for you and you know will be ultimately helpful for the organization. And the, the sales component is helping the people see, helping the people you speak with see what you see. So the first component is identifying those stakeholders. And there's usually, usually two groups. You're usually punching up and heading towards a boss, someone you have pitched to before, have tried to get budgetary sign off or tried to hire someone. There's often some established uh, established success, established tension. There's often an established channel. The other, when in my opinion, more challenging component is what we're going to talk about today is that teammate that you may work with a little bit who may already have some kind of repo. Maybe they store something in Confluence. Maybe there's a whole team in another department that uses uh, a, a bunch of different spreadsheets. Maybe there's someone else who's using a purpose-built tool to do their own analysis and then they kind of just spit it off to you in a PowerPoint. There's so many different things that could be uh, happening already that makes this much more challenging because ultimately what you're really asking people to do is change how they work. And nobody likes to change how they work. This is the last thing anybody wants. No one wants to make a decision and no one wants to change how they work. So this is much more challenging. So that's the stakeholder that we're going to focus on today. And it also has the benefit of what's kind of like if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. If you can convince a colleague that has no bearing on on your compensation, your promotion, anything, you have no bearing on them. If you can convince that person to use the repo and su be successful, then it's gonna be a lot easier to convince your boss. And you'll have more people already bought in using it, so that'll give you a stronger army of people to pitch up if you need to. So your approach is going to be fairly similar no matter who you talk to, but we'll, we'll take a different, there'll be a little bit of a different output. So what does that approach look like? How do you make this presentation to that one person to be so successful that first time, that really strong first impression? There are four stages, and we're going to go over how to do each of those stages to be really successful. The first one is a pre-pitch. So I have a unique advantage of being a consultant. I often come into teams that have something. There's usually some way of sharing research. and. I will say from the very beginning, the very first intake call before they've even decided to hire me, hey, we're also going to set up this research repository called Enjoy HQ because I found it's really, really helpful for teams who understand research, do research, need to access research. Often we're not going to set it up right away because we know there's compliance. We know I'm not often being hired to set up a repository. There's something else. Research for many teams is not the end. It's one step to the end. So I will mention it once and then I will mention it again when I notice, hey, you know, it takes 16 emails for me to go back and forth with different people to get my hands on some transcripts. This would have taken two minutes and enjoy HQ if everything was there and mention it five, six, ten times before we're really getting to a place where a decision is, you know, possible. And that's when there's a moment of saying concretely, I want I am ready to have this conversation. Let's create that space. We'll talk about that in a moment. Then there's planning the pitch. And this is where most of the work is. You do this and then a lot of the other steps kind of fall into place. Collecting all of the data and organizing your research on your colleagues in a way to help show them that they're going to be uh, really, their lives are going to improve with a research repository. We're going to go over a structure and some some of my favorite techniques to calm jitters if you happen to be nervous or you're you're worried things could get out of hand if a call goes off the rails. Uh, you have a colleague where calls often go off the rails. Some techniques to help make that a little bit easier. And then finally, the, the follow-up. Because as Sophia mentioned, with respect to momentum, 
you don't want to leave any room for people to forget about it because it's so easy to forget about the big complicated thing of how do you put the data in how do you ma manage the data what's my taxonomy look like these are all large challenges and so we want to set it up so that we're proactively meeting them we're expecting them we're ready to confront them head on and we have a plan for it so that your the first stage of how i like to work with uh, new teams is to get some kind of concrete information about what's going on in their world before we even go into the room to do a demo or a pitch so i call this centering the teams the teammates need as part of the conversation and i will send a note sometimes by email by slack maybe mention it at the end of the call and say hey i i know this repository is going to be really helpful you've heard me mention these problems a couple of times with how to access research i think it's also going to help you with insert insert here problem that they have if the, if you know like a colleague has mentioned oh we did some duplicate research or oh this competitor launched launched a feature we and then we found out six months later we had some data we could have used whatever intel you already have use it to say i know you're experiencing some trouble related to this i can't wait to show you how we can work on it concretely set a time at least a week or two in the future give yourself plenty of time to plan don't plan it for tomorrow or the next day and then this is the really important part. Is there anything that you want to cover? Or we mentioned, maybe you've talked about a repo a little bit, maybe you haven't. Is there any, do you have any questions? That it's called Enjoy HQ. Have you heard of it? Did you go to their site? Is there anything that you're wondering about? Because what you're really doing here is establishing, establishing your problems first to say like, this is why I'm doing this. This is my, what's going on for me. But I understand you have these problems and there's these benefits for you. And I want to make sure this is really about you. So giving your colleague an opportunity to articulate their challenges, establish their pain points, and really center their needs. And I kind of call this, OK, so once you get this great intel and you have this pre-pitch, and maybe you get a good response, maybe you have to kind of dig a little deeper, then it's time for you to start planning what you're going to say, how you're going to say it, how you frame out that conversation. You're planning your pitch, or as I like to say, you're preparing to make someone's day. If you go into a presentation thinking, how can I get them to use it? Oh my goodness, how will, I just need to convince them. If only I can get them to use it the way that I'm telling them to do it, it's much more stressful for you. It's much more uncomfortable for them. You're coming at it from a perspective of, uh, in copywriting, we call this me-focused messaging. Instead, you want to flip it to you-focused messaging. So if you think of this instead as a way to solve someone's problem, to add value or uh, to help somebody do their job better, if you even know what they're, how they get evaluated, what they get promoted on, what their KPIs are, you can even work that into the conversation. So you're really making this conversation about them. It's a pitch to use and joy, but it's really a pitch about solving whatever problem that they have. And so the phases of what you're going to go over, there's a process called message matching. That's where you meet them where you are. You just collected that data from your pre-pitch. How, you, how do you establish that you're understanding what their pain points are and how do you work with them? Then you're going to pitch to those problems, in that stage of awareness. I mentioned the stage of awareness before. We'll go into it a little bit more detail. And then finally, you're going to position the repository as a solution to the problems they have. Not the problems you have necessarily that can come into play, but it may not be the primary uh, message. And this is this is a copywriting structure. Message matching and then articulating the problem, agitating it, really going after the consequences, and then positioning your offer, which is, hey, I have a solution. It's called a repository as the, as the uh, solution. So the first thing you're going to want to do is say, all right, what is the pain that they're feeling. So again, your primary pain could be different from theirs. If you're coming in saying, I, or they come to you and say, I can't conduct analysis easily. Maybe they're using a purpose-built tool. Maybe they're using a spreadsheet and they're wondering, how do I keep track of these analyses? I have to put them in a PowerPoint to share with a stakeholder, but then I need to share the raw data with somebody else. And then somebody comes to me six months later asking for it and I don't even remember how I saved it because the nomenclature of how I articulated the file name, where you, which full, it gets out of hand really quickly. So if that's where somebody is stuck, how can you help them with that problem? Maybe you have someone who says their pain is, I just cannot find the research quickly. I have to go through all these places to find it. This is most often the problem that I am facing. 
There will be a product team member that has conducted some research. There will be a UX specific research. There will be marketing research. Maybe there's even a dedicated researcher as well. And they all have different ways of sharing data and I can never get my, I can never get my hands on it and I need it and I want it and it's going to be so helpful. How do I get it? So if that's the problem that your customer, your customer, your audience is working through, how can you help them find what they need? And then finally, maybe they're, they're worried about being vulnerable to competition due to not being able to see the insights that are going to help their business move forward. Okay, so once you understand where they are, you can message match. You can say here is, you articulate back to the person that you're speaking to, joining that conversation that they're happening in their head. And then pitching, the next stage is about pitching to their level of awareness with respect to the pain. So there's pain and understanding of the pain. And that's the stage of awareness. There are five stages of awareness, and this is one of the oldest conversion copywriting rules, principles, it's been around forever. Uh, and there's also levels of intent. So people can be in different levels of awareness and intent, there's, it's, they can be in a combination of different ones. So the first is unaware. So you may be speaking with someone who is just unaware of any kind of problem related to research management. I would not pitch to this person if you can avoid it. This is going to be a really tough sell because this person's not even aware that there's a problem. You have to convince them that there is. There may also be somebody who is what we call pain aware. This is a very common place to start. And this is somebody who maybe has had some trouble finding or using or sharing or analyzing their research. Maybe they're not using tools. Maybe they're still just popping everything into, or they're getting it, it transcribed and leaving it in the transcription tool until they absolutely need to use it. Solution aware is where a very, uh, a large majority of customers pain solution and product aware where most people tend to be when we're writing any kind of sales message. And when you're working with your teammates, it will likely, will likely fit in somewhere here. A solution aware prospect, we would say, or a solution aware audience member, maybe they're actively using a spreadsheet or a relational database. Maybe they're using a purpose-built tool, but they're not using a really dedicated repository that does everything that you need the tool to do. And then next, they might be product aware. So this is someone maybe you've talked to them about Enjoy HQ. Maybe you and your team are already using it and you've started to share some research. So somebody's seen it, they kind of understand it. They're not sure how it applies to their problem necessarily, but they understand how it works. And then finally, most aware. Most aware is you. You are so excited about the repository, getting everyone set up, using it to its full advantage. You understand how it's going to help. Even if you don't know all the nitty gritty, you know that the tool you've chosen is going to be the best solution for what you're working through. So each person that you speak with is going to be at a different level of awareness and their different level of awareness is going to affect how you pitch to them. On top of that, they may also be very motivated or very unmotivated to solve the problem. So somebody who really feels the pain might be a little easier and wanting to move a little bit faster than somebody who's like, yes, but this is a problem, but we're also bleeding revenue and that's a bigger problem, for example. So once you understand their stage of awareness, you position a repository as a solution to whatever their pain is and their level of pain. And it's, it's different. You don't make the same pitch to somebody who's uh, very aware of um, not being able to find data as you do to somebody who's unaware of being able to find data. So to give you an example, if you are speaking to what we call a pain aware audience or reader, you're going to focus a lot of your messaging and a lot of your pitch, a significant portion of the communication on articulating the problem articulating the consequences, building up how debilitating it might be to not have a research repository as it relates to them. So you might want to, if you know duplicate studies have been done, make it really visual. Bring those duplicate studies and show show some stats, show some numbers. Did, did these two studies each take a quarter or each take a week or whatever it happens to be, and as a result of how long they both took, you couldn't work on some other higher, uh, other high priority project. Maybe you can even bring in the feature that a competitor launched and say, this is what we, one person, some intern we hired to do a little bit of research, 
passed it off to their manager and ne nothing ever happened from there. And meanwhile, somebody else came in, built it, and they're gonna, they're nipping at our heels now. And for, again, the most common pain point that I experience, there are lots of different pieces, communication pieces, emails, chats, Google Doc comments, all over the place. And it's really difficult to stitch them all together. So I'm going to show you an example uh, let's see, I'm going to share switch sharing screen to a tab. So we will see if this works. I think it will. Yeah, okay, great. So this is loading now. So this is my favorite way to make a really clear visualization of what is happening to somebody who may not be involved. So oftentimes, if you're working with a senior researcher or somebody who's in a senior position or somebody who is uh, well established in how to get data and just like comfortable with how long it takes, maybe they've gotten used to it, they may not see what it's really like. And you can take your what you know and say, hey, this is this is how bad it really is. So how many clicks to get to the center of a customer insight? And I think uh, Lucas did share the link. There's also going to be a PDF if you want to get this as well. So I like to show the actual emails and everything here is fictionalized, anonymized data, but this is how data gets shared. A lot of the times it's just one person emailing another person some transcripts and you're like, okay, cool. I think these were the accountants you mentioned. I don't really know. Maybe they were, maybe they weren't. And then oftentimes there will be different insights that are batched into it. So maybe someone will send you some transcripts and say, oh, did you see this really interesting paragraph? Or, hey, I wanted to talk to you about something in the transcript. So you have these two different things that you have to deal with in a single email. How do you split that up? How do you refer back to it? Do you have to remember this subject line if you want to come back and find this transcript? Because that's a nightmare. So this is how things get passed around. And that means two things. It means, first of all, if I, if I remember something or if my colleague remembers something, we're writing an email or we're building a feature, we've got some, some piece of copy that we're excited to use. We say, oh, you know, that reminds me of that quote in that one interview that we did with that person. I think they live in Texas and they said something about fraud. What do you do? What can you do? Well, you have to go hunt down through everything. And the same is true if someone says, oh, that's really interesting. Where do I, did we see it anywhere else? Is this, is this a word that people use often? Or is it something that only appears once? Do we have confirmation? Can we use this publicly? A lot of times I'll also use Enjoy HQ as a way of storing raw transcripts for conversations that become customer interviews or, or customer case studies that we want to share publicly. So we need a record of what the, the original conversation was and also can we say that this person as a result of our services was able to book 35 new clients i don't know it would be nice so you see this happening and you say okay well what am i gonna do what do i do with this information how do i go find the answers to these questions and if you don't have a repository unfortunately you have to go deep into if you're lucky if you're lucky deep into drive and maybe this is how it's organized maybe you've got your transcript maybe you've got your notes Maybe you've got a presentation and that somebody just abbreviated with a couple of letters. Maybe someone else wrote, oh, this is a really interesting, but that's all they say. Like you don't get any information about what interesting means. Maybe there's also multiple studies. So even if you search for transcripts, maybe you also pull in things for, th for different types of companies or if you are, uh, if you have your script and your your uh, the instructions that you have for how you're going to run your interviews, maybe that comes up. So how do you sort through this? And especially if you don't know the exact word, but you know the context, you have to go through everything. Okay, so I will go through this with clients and I will really articulate how much pain this causes. And then there's a second pain. So this is the pain of finding data, sharing data. There's also the pain of being able to analyze data. So let's say I have a transcript and it lives in Google Docs or it lives in a Word doc. Maybe it lives in a purpose-built tool and I see something interesting and I highlight it. Then what? It stays with me. It doesn't get shared out elsewhere unless I proactively copy, paste, put it someplace or I have to manually take all the snippets out and go put them in some other place and organize it in a way. It, it becomes a full project when I know and if I had it in a repository, it would be like a five-second project. Maybe
30 seconds. It might take a, like there's still a little, a couple of steps, but it's going to be so much easier to have it shared in a place to start with and not just living with you. The other reason that having things stay just with you is let's say you're going through a transcript and Office fans will see this is a this is a study that was a fictional study that was conducted on the accounting department uh, at Dunder Mifflin Scranton to see if there's how expense reports get managed and processed. And through that process, the interviewer learned, you know what, there there is a lot of antagonism between management and the people in the accounting department. And isn't that kind of interesting? We might want to pay attention to that for next time. But again, I'm in the middle of a study. It's not, I'm exhausted from reading through all the insights, absorbing all of this human emotion. And I have to go remember that I put this here next time and come back to it. It's just going to get lost. It, I am, Even though I have it, it could still get lost. So then I'll show some graphics like this. And you can take this and adapt it as you like. Use your own screenshots of emails, of chats. There might be more cool things that you can share to show what those shortcomings are. And then summarize whatever that outcome is or what the solution would be. So if you were able to store everything in one place, what does that look like? What can you do? And really articulate what the positive outcome is going to be. You have your transcripts, your support tickets, your responses. If you're sending doing email based research, it all goes to one place. Or if you want to search for a specific word or there's something around trust that you want to start managing, even though you're, you're talking about expenses, but there's something really interesting happening. Like you're talking about expense management features, but there's something really interesting happening over here related to trust and fraud. So you really want to explore that. You can do it. You may also want to be able to quantify those insights. If you see something more than once, you want to be able to flag it more than once, build a nice graph. If you have data, if you've already started to build out repository, uh, build out your own repository and you add a study in, you may even show what the actual graph looks like. And then you can share really easily. You can share by copying and pasting a link. And then the person can come in and get their whole context asynchronously all over the world without having to ask lots of follow-up questions by email without just seeing a random snippet of conversation in their inbox. So there's a lot of really cool things you can do. And I liked, I liked, I'm getting really excited because this is one of my favorite parts of the process because you're really helping somebody see how bad it is, how difficult their current state is. And if you can make a really strong case of how things are not going as well as you want, then you can start to make it go, you can make the case for how a better future might be. Okay, now I'm going to switch back. We'll see if we're, we can get two for two. All right, okay, cool. So if you have a pain aware prospect, that kind of presentation may take up a significant portion prospect. I'm still in copywriter language. That if you have a pain aware colleague or teammate, that portion of the conversation that you have may take up the bulk of your time. But you may also have what we call a solution aware leader and that You'll still want to have that there. It just may take up less time. So if you're speaking with somebody who has used a purpose-built research tool, they know those pains are common if you put everything into Google Drive, but they're starting to have really specific problems related to analysis. They just cannot see how many times somebody has mentioned a discovery habit, a way that they find a product or service, the way they search for it. Maybe there's a, a form. They just can't find it. So that's what you may want to show them. So I, the other feature I use most often when I am making that pitch to someone is to say, uh, what, um, what do you want to, what do you want to know? What words are you thinking about? And use the universal search to do it right in front of them. Something I haven't worked up the courage to, but if you have the courage and you want to try, I would love to hear if anyone does this, is to say, okay, we're both going to search for something. I put it in in, uh, in Joy HQ. You have it wherever you have it. We're going to do a search. I'm using universal search. You're using whatever you're using. Who's going to find it first? How much time is it going to take? And if you can search for it and you can show that you find it in 10 seconds and they take several minutes, then that can be a way of really helping someone feel what that solution looks like. Um, I also really like to take in a little bit of data. So if there's a short, small study that you can bring in and say, here's 50 points of data we have, here's what the analysis looks like, or here's what our initial taxonomy might be, 
really tailoring the, the way that you start using the features to somebody else and their pain points can go a long way here. So now that you've done all this planning, it's time to run your call. And guess what? All of that planning is like 90% of the work. So you have already identified where they are. You've identified their stage of awareness. You can pitch to their problems, whatever objections they have. Maybe you you know them well enough to say, like, I know this person is you know, going to ask this question about how we can incorporate full story videos, and I can be ready for that. And then you're ready to position the repository as a solution. So you've, you've done the work. You're ready to make this first call. And again, buy-in happens one conversation at a time. So you, you're really making this presentation about helping that person get really excited. So what do you do? What does that actually look like? I kind of, if you, I don't know if, I don't really have much of a theater background, but I kind of think of a presentation like a little bit of a performance and it has different beats that you want to hit. So there's your introduction. You're going to want to, again, do that message matching, articulate back to them how you're here to help them solve whatever problem they have with respect to research management. And the first act is then saying, okay, here is, let's go into that more. Let's really dig into that. You'll spend a lot of time here for pain aware prospects. You'll spend more time on the second act, which is the features for more solution aware uh, uh, teammates. And then finally, you're getting to the end, the finale. And you don't want to end your call saying, cool, let me know what you think. It's very common to end conversations like, hey, go ahead, take some time, whatever you want to do. You want to be really concrete. This is momentum. Momentum does not happen by accident. Momentum happens with lots of careful planning. So you can say, all right, next, I want to, I want to show you, uh, I want to show you what's going to happen after our call. I want to build a taxonomy. I want to show you some data. I want to show you what your teammates can do. And we're going to do that. Let's look at our calendars now and find some time. And another thing too, so this is something I used to do a lot when I was first, when I was new to consulting and I had to pitch to clients who made me very nervous. I would say, okay, what's my line? So that way you're not finding yourself in the call, scrambling for words, wondering what to say, especially if there's any kind of tension or animosity, which there might be, and it's often not intentional. A lot of times people just, they have other things to do and they don't know what your thing is about and how it can help them. So what I like to do is write down the lines. What are the things I want to, want to make sure I say? Maybe it's, hey, I know you've been struggling, not being able to find research. I know, like we just came off this project where we missed something huge. I've also seen, been seeing this and I really want to uh, show you how these consequences are manifesting even more than, we, than we've really considered. I'm a researcher, I'm gonna research the problem. So now I want to show you something that I think is going to be really helpful. I mentioned it to you once before. You've heard me mention it a couple of times. I sent you the website, whatever, a little, remind them that you've pre-pitched them and that you're not blind signing them. Hey, and next I'd like to show you something, some other component. So what is that other component and decide what it's going to be. Maybe give yourself some options before we get on the call. And then that's when you follow up right after whatever plan you make, you're going to keep that momentum flowing. You add more value to whatever's going on in their world, add their data, like it's about them now. You've, you've, you're sold on having our repository. You understand how it works. How can you add their data so that they're really excited? Maybe you demo their teammates. I worked with one uh, client. I think I, I think I demoed in Joy HQ to uh, one or two group demos of five to eight people and probably 10 to 12 individual one-on-one -on -one demos coming in saying, hey, what do you, what are you using this for? What do you need voice of customer data for? What are you working on coming up with a way to show them how they can find it and then showing them and then off they go. And again, setting those really clear next steps. So what happens next? You're defining, this is, uh, uh, I guess I just said this on the last slide. So you're going to just be really concrete about what happens next. The more concrete you can be, the less wishy-washy, the less ambivalent, the more you keep the momentum going. Going, Yeah, and then you're off to the races. Rinse, repeat, continue helping people, nudging them along wherever they are. You're getting them from one stage of awareness to the next. So you go from your pre-pitch to understand the problem. You plan your pitch based on where they are at the beginning. You give that presentation. You uncover more data from there. and You follow up and then again, repeat, go through again. It's very unlikely that you will have people go from pain aware to yes, let's buy 100 licenses or yes, I definitely want my whole team to use it like that. 
there's likely going to be several conversations, but you're planning for it, so you're going to be ready to do that. And the last thing, the last note I will leave you on is my one of my favorite quotes of all time is that sales is a transfer of enthusiasm. So you're really excited about having a repository. You know how it can be helpful. You've documented it. How can you transfer what you know to somebody else so that they can be enthusiastic and they can be really excited? And just because somebody isn't, maybe you've already had a really rough conversation and you're like, ugh, I cannot go back to that person. Just because they say, I don't think so right away, there may just be a miscommunication. There may be another way for you to go back, regroup, understand more and say, hey, you know, I think I understand what you're dealing with a little bit better now. Let's, let's see if this works. I think it might work for this other problem that you have. So it's all about centering the needs of your audience, your, the people that you're working with, and the more you do that, the more successful you'll be. All right, so that is that. Thank you all so much for your generous time and attention. Um, Sophia, if you wanna pop back Yes, in. indeed. That was amazing. That was amazing. And as you're going through the presentation, I am remembering all the conversations that I've been having for the last five years with a ton of different research design product teams that are trying to um, implement the repository. They have done it successfully. Some others not, so not that successfully. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I want to remind everybody, yes. especially that we have customers, is that what you're trying to achieve here is not uh, a slightly tweak of how you work. What you're trying to do is you're trying to help an organization to make the most out of the data that you already have. You're helping a bunch of team members across the business to make better decisions and to feel closer to customers. You are engineering how data flows between multiple tools and, and multiple research studies. So, so this is it is a big deal when, when, when it comes to the when it comes to understanding the impact that you can have if you implement this successfully. So it's gonna be much more challenging than just saying, oh, we need a survey tool. Let's implement a survey tool. And what I'm saying here is that whether you pick Airtable, uh, another kind of specialized tool like Enjoy HQ, Enjoy HQ, a spreadsheet, or you are going to be building uh, an internal tool and you have engineers that can do that, like Microsoft did or maybe Uber did with their insights kind of uh, internal tools. It doesn't matter the shape or form. Of course, if you have a tool that helps you and does the job well, it will make it easier. But the, the, the issue here is not the tool. It is your ability to bring people on board and help them see how much better this can be, how much we can get done together if we can have access to the right data, how much we as a researchers are going to be able to build impact and really affect decisions that are driven by customer understanding. So. It is a big project. It, it does feel scary, but it's really about change management. And the more you get closer to the different kind of circles of influence that you have in the organization, the easier it will get. Um, but it's, it's worth doing. We try to do uh, webinars and calls and case studies with um, as many teams as we can. Uh, they are happy to share their implementations. And, and the common denominator there is that it took time at the beginning, but it was worth it. Because now people can self-serve the insights. Now it feels that there is more collaboration between teams. Now you're saving a bunch of time instead of jumping into tools. So being able to keep the eye on the prize and knowing that you're doing this for a reason um, is what's gonna help you drive that change. But it takes, it takes time, it takes a strategy, and it takes focus. Uh, but it's kind of one of those things that you leave a legacy, right? Once you've done this right and you get everybody on board, you can move on to a next job if you want, and you know that this has been something that transformed that business. And you can then replicate that for other businesses that might be sure. So I love this. We spent five years of my life trying to solve this problem, help teams, because it's fascinating. No matter how and which angle you see it, you are you are transforming culture, you are transforming systems, and it's, and it's it's a rewarding type of work where you actually help other people in the business to to make better decisions. So I know you have questions there, and we're gonna go through them uh, right now. I wanted to address a comment actually, Sean or somebody else before said like when we were talking about the roadmap, like how do we identify if the solution is a repository in the first place or not? 
we are we definitely going to do a session about it but the, the short answer to that is that you have to have some sort of like a uh, like a checklist or checkpoints of where your organization is when it comes to uh, uh, maturity and UX maturity. So if your organization, your business, again, is interested in user research, is investing in user research, and that means concrete investment in tools, concrete investment in, in, in hiring more designers and more researchers. Uh, if the organization is having mostly travel trying to get things done because they keep asking other people and they keep jumping into tools and the data is unknown and we don't know how, whether or not we are repeating uh, research projects and so on. If the program is more about data flow, uh, data findings, uh, connecting dots across multiple data sources and multiple studies, if that is the problem that you are experiencing right now, the most likely repository will help you a lot. But if you're in an organization where you have that problem of data flow, but on top of that, nobody cares about research. They, they haven't hired anybody to do research in a dedicated way, or maybe they have one researcher, but completely stretched. There is absolutely no possibility for that person to do something else than just the research that's been done. Introducing a repository will make it really hard. We had uh, a webinar that probably you um, Done before with uh, the researcher at Honeybook, and I think she might be here. And so she is the only researcher at Honeybook, but Honeybook as an organization has a very strong customer driven culture. So the buying was easy. Everybody wanted this to happen. Everybody was craving for access and for connecting the dots and cross functional collaboration. So being the only researcher, if you have that environment, and then you have massive chances of success and you can really make impact faster. So the answer to that is, is it about data flow and productivity or is it about culture? So it is a delicate thing and sometimes can be confusing and that's why we need to talk about it a little bit more. But I hope that's helpful because normally when you come to these tools, you want to make sure that you are improving data flow and productivity. And as a consequence, you will affect culture and you will affect uh, as well, um, cross-functional collaboration. But it's, it's not that you build a repository and suddenly you are mature, you know, as a UX organization. That doesn't happen. It will be amazing. Um, so let's go actually for questions. So we have some questions. We have a couple of questions. So from Clara, we have here, that's, that's for you. Can you see the questions actually, Ali? Uh, I see the uh, chat, which has uh, quite a, no, a lot. Yes, yes. Oh, is it the the question mark? Yes, indeed. So, do you want to take the first question? <laughs> sure. Okay. So, is the first one? It's from Clara at one forty six. Do you have any suggestions okay, about how to break down the steps even further? So, for example, when you are doing the pre-pitch stage, is the deliverable some sort of mural that has a collection of everyone's pain points to be able to manage up? Great question. Okay, so the way that I do it is, um, it kind of depends. And I know that's no one likes when it depends, but there's no one way. Every team's a little different. Often I will say, okay, do I have a champion and an ally? Is there somebody else who feels this pain like I feel it? If the answer is yes, then awesome. you have you have a champion and ally. And in that case, uh, I like to center my, my pitch uh, even more steps early on. Like, hey, uh, do you have access to this? By the way, I think we should really make some time soon to talk about our repository because this is the fourth time that I have had to bug you for something that I don't want to keep bugging you for things. Um, if, you, if you don't have somebody and you're really wondering like I like I'm out here alone I don't know how I'm gonna get this done the pre-pitch I like to really ground that as just a uh, investigation that is information gathering so before you get to mural like the first time you ask them a question maybe you have maybe if you really don't know like the first time should not be like out of the blue but if you're having a conversation with someone and you're like hey you know we've been talking about this problem I think I might have a solution I'm starting to explore it like what you, what's going on? Like can we can you tell me a little bit more about what's going on? And maybe there's even a full conversation that happens before that the actual pitch. And you want that's a time for you to say, okay, tell me more about what you experience. Give you know we're researchers, so really understand the problem of what your colleague is understand or is dealing with. 
the deliverable part, the mural part, the pitch, I save that for later. That is the output of having done the research. So it's kind of like you're doing a little research project where you try to understand what the impact of not having the, um, the research accessible looks like, get that understanding, and then you move, move on. And kind of like Sophia was just explaining with how to know a repository is, is right, Another way that I like to come into it is saying, like, if you're tracking numbers, would you ever not use a quantitative tool? Like, if you're not tracking, you can't understand it. So if you're collecting qualitative data, like, hey, you know, maybe we should keep track of this as well. So that can be another entry point where we say, hey, I realized we're doing really good tracking over here. Not so good tracking over here. So uh, does that answer the question? We hope so. And I see what that is. I don't. I, um, oh, and also I would not put everyone's pain points. I would keep it focused on one person's experience. So there's uh, another great copywriting rule called the rule of one. You write for one reader. And in this case, you pitch to one person. So all about your experience or all about their experience. And then from there, you might build. But I'd, I like to go really deep on how painful it is and then have some broader outcomes of, of what that looks like. But it may be different. Every team's a little different. Like you may want to do a lot of different people's perspectives, but I can find I find that can be a little bit more overwhelming. Perfect. We have another one. You want to take that one, Swell? Yes. Archana. Okay. How would you, how, or how would you, the repo conversation pitch and buy-in look like for a smallish company with just a few stakeholders who actually do the research? I have done this as well. This is the hardest one. <laughs> this is the hardest of everything because if you are working with a team of really uh, great researchers who've established their way of doing, organizing the research over, uh, you know, sometimes a long career of 10 or 20 years, and then you come in and you want to change how they do that. This is the hardest one. So I take the same approach. I say, okay, yes, that's true. You may have your way of doing it, but the, your way of doing it is affecting new researchers, new to the team like me. So you might have a way that you can organize all of your data with your group of people, but as this company grows by having me come in or by whatever new avenue we're pursuing, maybe the team size isn't changing, but focus on whatever has changed that makes that old way of doing something no longer tenable. Yes. I will also add to this. Um, if you are, for example, I, I, if I understand the question maybe slightly differently, um, it, maybe if you're implementing this in a startup, you're like five people, everybody's doing research because you are, yeah, maybe, oh, okay. maybe that's the concept, uh, the, the context, but I will address that very quickly. Um, and it, it's actually like from that, if that is the question, uh, and it's about having a super tiny organization, maybe 10 people, 20 people, they, a lot of people are doing research, but it's not really like a full-time researcher there. Uh, it's all about, normally it's triggered, the pain is triggered by customer feedback. Research comes a little later. So what people call research in the early stages is mostly customer feedback management, which is like, you know, how many requests we go about this, how many people are complaining about that, and starting organizing or creating a process for that can, can give you the foundations of then thinking about whether or not you need a research repository and start implementing the, the basics. But for an organization that is very small, the focus sometimes is to help other people see, well, can we track what people are already asking? Can we track what people are already complaining about in a way that doesn't take us a bunch of hours every week? And as you get a little bit of a process there, it's a little easier to say, well, now let's do actually like in-depth research. So if we're doing interviews and we're doing other things on top of the feedback, can we have it in a way that we can also connect the dots between the feedback and those interviews? So it's a slow process. But again, it depends on what is the, the, the data sources. If you're a small company, sometimes you have a bunch of customer feedback coming from a bunch of places, but very little proper user research. And if you grow and you start hiring researchers, you will have both. You will have a lot of customer feedback and a lot of great research happening. So it's different stages, but both start from the same. Like, how can we make this less painful, period? Like, can we just have visibility on it? Um, perfect, so we are almost getting there. Uh, to finish the, the webinar, I wanted to share some information with you very quickly. Um, this is the webinar that we were talking about before. Lucas added the, the link to the webinar if you want to register there. It's going to be amazing. I already had a pick of the presentation. It's going to be so practical, so good, so focused. I'm being personal to a bunch of taxonomy webinars and master classes, and they're always very academic, so I'm very excited because this is on point. This is exactly about how you do that for a research repository. 
and she does that for a living and she's also a researcher. So I think it's going to be amazing. Then uh, in terms of uh, if you are new to Enjoy HQ, you are not a customer, you can book some time to talk to me and I can show you around what Enjoy HQ looks like and how other teams are using it. If you are a customer and you are here because you want to learn more about how you overcome some of the challenges that you might have today. It might be taxonomy, it might be implementation, you know, getting people on board. It might be anything about your research repository. If there's anything that is bothering you that you feel, oh, we are not there yet and we need a little bit of help, Ali is working with us. And so you can uh, book a call with Ali. That's her email, ali at getenjoyhq.com. Or you can talk to us uh, via intercom on the marketing side. But you can book a session with Ali an hour, whatever time you need for support, and we're here to help you. You can do that with me as well, but Ali has a ton of experience and really happy to help you. Uh, and remember to subscribe, actually. We have a YouTube channel. All the different videos that we're doing, all the webinars and so on are uploaded there, so you can get notifications when new uh, webinars are published. But I really appreciate you came today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ali. You're amazing. I really appreciate your time as well. Thank you, everyone. It was really great. This is really so fun. have an amazing week and talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.